The figure of this Jewish history podcast was the leader of Lithuanian Jewry in the first two decades of the 19th century. He was a man of extraordinary character and scholarship, and he was the most prominent disciple of the Gaon of Vilna. His behavior and his resplendent piety typified And through his monumental works, he crystallized and he promulgated an ideology of meticulous adherence to mitzvos and to Torah with all their intricate detail and, of course, an obsession with Torah study above all. Most notably, he founded the most important Jewish institution in 1700 years, the yeshiva in Volazhin which became the most impactful yeshiva since those founded in Babylon in the 220s, Sura and Pumpadisa. We're talking about Rabbi Chaim ben Yitzchak Itzkevich, known universally as Rabbi Chaim Volozhiner or Rabbi Chaim from Volozhin, the city in Belarus. His years are 1749 to 1821. Before we begin, I would like to talk about the recent hurricane that devastated Houston over the past week. Right now it's Friday, the 1st of September, and I am recording this from my house and the office inside my house. The previous 37 episodes of the Jewish History Podcast were recorded in a beautiful facility called the Torch Center, and each one of them was not recorded with a live audience, and here I am by myself in my office. In the past week, That building, which hosted daily Torah classes and many Jewish celebrations like bar mitzvahs, uh, my son Yitzi's bris, amongst other celebrations, and was the headquarters of our organization Torch, and it was the epicenter of Jewish adult education and outreach in Houston, and through the podcasts and videos, essentially the world, that facility was utterly destroyed by Hurricane Harvey. Over three agonizing days, Harvey deposited nearly 50 inches of rain over a city that averages 50 inches of rain a year. Now, Houston is particularly susceptible to flooding, given that it's almost entirely flat, and the ground is less absorbent than most, and therefore the city designed unique systems for directing and managing heavy rainfall. So there's a network of little rivers scattered throughout the city called bayous, which direct the water towards the Gulf of Mexico. But also the streets and the highways have been engineered to act as water basins for times of high rates of rainfall. The idea is to deliver water to the bayous at a manageable rate and prevent them from overflooding. That's the idea. And of course, that works great, provided you don't have this once every 500 year storm. Uh, This hurricane was so intense and the rainfall rate was so unprecedented that every, everything failed. And I'm sure everyone's seen pictures and videos of the highways and the roads and the bayous all overflowing and flooding anything in their wake. In some places, the water level reached 15 to 20 feet, you know, entirely covering homes and businesses and cars and all that. And many, many of our students, of our friends, of our supporters lost their homes or had sustained massive damage to their homes, their cars, their businesses. Uh, There's one particularly sad episode of a family uh, facing a mandatory evacuation order from the city. They leave their home. Several days later, they return, and they discover that their home is looted. All their jewelry, computers, family heirlooms, gone. Uh, For me personally, for us, the neighborhood where we live in is elevated, and fairly far from the bayous, and almost no homes were flooded. Yes, of course, the streets were flooded, the streets were impassable for several days, but for the most part, the water remained in the streets and eventually receded back to the bayous. But the torch center, which is situated adjacent to one of the main bayous, was entirely submerged under several feet of water. And by now, of course, the waters have receded, but the damage remains. And Houston as a city, and of course, the Jewish community as a community, and Torch as an organization, we face monumental rebuilding efforts. That will take a long time and be very trying, but with the Almighty's help, we will forge ahead and rebuild it better than ever. Uh, On Wednesday, 
after the waters receded, we had a contractor come in and give us an estimate of what it would cost to get the things back in order. Remember, the, there's two and a half feet of water in the, in the center, in the torch center. And if you let that be, you're going to have mold and it's going to be terrible. So we had a contractor come in and he gives us an estimate, $8,000 for demo, just demo alone. So instead of paying that, yesterday, Thursday, we had an army of volunteers, including one who drove 55 miles to join us. We give masks so they don't need to breathe in the noxious air. And we started hacking away at the sheetrock, ripping up all the carpets. Someone brought over some bagels and beer, and we worked the whole day until the place was gutted. If you want to see how it looks, I posted pictures uh, in rabbiwalby.com forward slash Harvey. I'll put the link in the description. And now we have to wait for it to dry. We sprayed it so it doesn't get moldy. And once it's fully dry, we could start the process of hopefully rebuilding it. Uh, I've responded to uh, scores of emails and texts and phone calls from friends all over the world. And that's been an experience that everyone that I've uh, spoken to has shared. Uh, It's amazing the amount of concern for our well-being. You know, I think it's really remarkable and inspiring the outpouring of kindness, of generosity, of love that has been heaped upon us in these uh, very difficult times. Uh, It's not going to be easy for us to rebuild the Torch Center. It's not going to be inexpensive. Uh, We suffered a tremendous blow that really will linger for some time, but we are determined to rebuild with resolve and to hopefully resume operations as soon as possible. But to do that, we need your help. Uh, If you're able to support us in our dire time of need, please visit rebuildtorch.com. I'm going to put a link in the description and make a donation to help us rebuild and get back onto our feet. Uh, As for the history podcasts, I'm going to try to record them as consistently as possible. Of course, I don't have a facility to do that. I'll have to find places that are quiet, uh, maybe in my house or elsewhere. But please have some patience if they're not, uh, they don't come out as regularly as usual. And of course, as always, you can email me at rabbiwalby at gmail.com, any questions or comments. And thank you all who have already donated. And thank you all for your support. And of course, back to our history podcast uh, about Rabbi Chaim Volajner. Uh, he had an auspicious birthday. He was born on Shavuos, the holiday, the festival of Shavuos in 1749 in the town of Volajn, today's city in Belarus. And on that, va- on that very same day, the famous Ger Tzedek, the righteous convert of Vilna, known as Avraham ben Avraham, Abraham, the son of Abraham, was burned at the stake by the Inquisition. This is an interesting story uh, about the times. It does show, of course, what Jews were living through uh, during the middle of the 18th century. This individual, his father was called Graf Patatsky, uh, and he was the wealthiest man in Poland and Russia. The legend has it that he owned 999 estates, and he refused to buy the thousandth estate because it takes longer to say he owns 999 estates than to say he owns a thousand. So this really wealthy Catholic, Graf Patatsky, his son, Valentin, was studying to become a priest. And a very inquisitive, intelligent, precocious young man, he began, began to question Catholicism, and he started secretly studying Torah with a Jewish scholar. And eventually he converts to Judaism and he disappears and his parents are infuriated and they're trying to find him and he goes into hiding near Vilna and he's fearful that his parents may catch him. This Garrett said, this Avraham ben Avram, he dresses as a pious Jew, which indeed he was, with a long coat and beard and pious and he sits down in a small shul and studies Torah day and night while his parents are frantically searching for him. And of course, there's a whole story behind this, but one day, sadly and tragically, a Jewish tailor reveals his identity and whereabouts to the church authorities. They arrest him, and they tell him, either you come back to Christianity, or you're going to be burned alive. And this martyr, this Garrett said, this righteous convert, refuses to even consider the idea, and on the second day of Shavuos, which is one of the happiest days of the Jewish calendar, 
the church burned him alive in the town square in Vilna. There are many dramatic accounts of his death. Uh, there's a famous song that he composed on that day that we still have a tradition uh, of what that song is. And then as the fire began to consume his body, he screamed, Shema Yisrael, and his holy soul ascended to heaven. And on the day that that soul, that holy and pure soul ascended to heaven, another holy and pure soul descended from heaven and that was the day that Rabbi Chaim Volazhin was born. The Talmud says in the book of Yuvamos that a pure soul is not taken from this world until it has been replaced by an equally pure soul. Perhaps it is no coincidence that on the day that the Gerrit Senek was martyred, Rabbi Chaim Volazhin was born. Now we don't know a great deal about his youth other than he studied Torah all the time. In the classic Nefesh HaChaim, the book that he would go on to author uh, in the introduction, his son uh, writes that as a youth, he would study Torah with his brother day and night. And they would study into the night, and as the lights of the candles would extinguish, they'd take the books outside and study using the moonlight. And as a youth, he studied under the tutelage of the famed author of the Shadis Arya, but his primary teacher he found as a late teenager where he moved to Vilna, which is about 120 kilometers away from Volazhin, and he became one of the disciples of the Gaon of Vilna. And it's interesting, while everyone agrees that he was the greatest disciple of the Gaon of Vilna, we don't really have a great many amount of stories between the two. And the reason given is because what the Gaon would do he would sit cloistered in a room with a handful of students and study Torah day and night. And there wasn't time for anything else or interest for anything else. And therefore, we don't really know a lot about their relationship. Uh, there is one story, for example, that we know is a few stories. One of them uh, was that Rabbi Chaim came to his teacher and told him that he studied the order of Moed. We know the Talmud is broken down into six sections, one of them called Moed which has all the books that talk about Jewish festivals and Jewish holidays. And he said he studied it 19 times, and he still doesn't know it so well. So the Gohan responds, 19 times only? You have to continue studying your entire life. Maybe then you'll know it. Of course, for anyone to finish any book of Talmud is a grand achievement. To finish a order of Talmud, even once, is a grander achievement to do it 19 times is a level of diligence that uh, is beyond our purview. And he became a scholar of otherworldly proportions. Uh, his son writes that at the age of 25, he gained a clear knowledge of all of Talmud with all of its com- commentaries, essentially all of Torah. But he was also a man of great character and great humility. Uh, his son emphasizes in his introduction that the humility of my father was evident in every encounter that he had. Even though he was the giant of the generation, he was the greatest rabbi, scholar, pious Jewish leader after the Gohan died, he walked around like an ordinary person. Another example of his humility, uh, he became the leading halachic authority of his time, and thousands of halachic queries were sent to him from all over Europe. And he would write responses. And he never signed off with his salutation, Chief Rabbi of Elijah. Instead, he wrote the Malamed of the, the school teacher of Elijah. He would always try to diminish his stature and do things in a hidden way, to not broadcast his greatness to the world. Uh, in Elijah, uh, of course, it would snow frequently in, in, in the winters, and the yeshiva students would wake up really early in the morning to go study, and they'd find that the path uh, towards the building was always shoveled, and no one knew who, who had shoveled the snow in the middle of the night. So one time, there was a particularly uh, aggressive snowstorm, and the students decided to stay up. And who did they see? The great Rabbi Chaim Volazhiner, the greatest rabbi and scholar and leader of his generation, is shoveling snow by himself 
uh, as a simpleton. And when people started saying that he was the greatest student of the Gon, uh, Rabbi Chaim wrote a letter. And he says, I hear people are calling me a student of the Gon. I see it as my obligation to make it known to all. Heaven forbid that I detract from the honor of the Gon of Vilna as if to say that I carry on his legacy. Whoever calls me a student of the Gon of Vilna is making a tremendous mistake. Uh, even though we know that he is universally accepted as being his greatest disciple. And even the children of the Gon of Vilna, they wrote that he was the most prominent of the students of the Gon. But his reverence and his awe for his teacher is evident every time he mentions him. For example, the Gon wrote a commentary on Safra Ditsniusa, which literally means in Aramaic, the hidden book, which is an esoteric, arcane part of the Zohar, which, of course, in itself is the Jewish book of mysticism, of hidden Torah. So it's the esoterica of the esoteric, and it's made clear, at least for people who understand these themes, by the commentary of the Gon. And in the introduction uh, to that commentary, written by Rabbi Chaim, he writes as follows. Even though studying the halachic aspects of Torah, it requires prayer to understand its depths and to gain insight into its subtle nuances. That's by the revealed parts of Torah. What are we going to say about the essence of Torah, the soul of the holy Torah, referring to the hidden parts of Torah? That even the Tanaim, the rabbis of the Mishnahic era, and the Amoraim, the rabbis of the the rabbis and scholars of the Talmudic era, and even the true Mikubalim, the Kabbalists, all they know are, are are the basic abstract insights, just the just the generalities. Even someone who understands greatly understands very little. How could you find wisdom? It's as if people are drunk, but not from wine. People are confused. People are disoriented. People are like blind people fumbling in the air trying to understand these deep insights of the Zohar. But thanks to the Almighty's compassion and love for us, to uphold his Torah, it should not be forgotten. He sent us a holy one from heaven, a man who the Spirit of God is in him, our great teacher, the Gon, the genius, the light of the world, that the holiness of his Torah and his piety was already declared from one end of the world unto the other end of the world. Moran of Arabna, our master, our teacher, Rabbi Elio, the pious one, the holy one from Vilna, that every secret is known to him. And he goes on with many, many more uh, honorifics about his teacher. Now, a defining aspect of this ideology, this old school Lithuanian ideology, is a rigid inflexibility to compromise on even an iota of deviation from Torah and Halacha. As such, the Gon and his student afterwards were initially strongly opposed to the Hasidic movement. The Hasidic movement that rose in the 18th century, they emphasized and prioritized the feeling and the meaning behind observance of mitzvos, and were willing to compromise in certain areas, most notably regards to the time of prayer. And they felt that if someone is not in the zone, they're not ready to pour out their heart to their creator, then they should wait and try to get in the spirit of prayer before they start praying. And the problem is that halacha has clearly defined timetables of when you're supposed to pray. And in the eyes of Rabbi Chaim Velazhin, that the law and the halacha must be observed fastidiously and that can never be cast aside. And therefore, that, that, that was at the core of the great conflict that embroiled the Jewish world at the end of the 18th century between the Hasidim and what became known as the Misnadim, or those that opposed them. And Rab Chaim is said to have said rhetorically uh, that the Hasidim, they would go out and say, should we daven mincha? 
let's go outside and see if there are stars, which of course is very ironic that uh, you would wait for Mincha until the stars come out, because according to the strict letter of the law, once the stars come out, it's too late to pray Mincha. Uh, now his book, Nefesh HaChaim, which is an ideological counterbalance to the Tanya, the ideological book of Hasidus, he writes, quote, God forbid, chalila v'chalila lanu, that we should reject even a detail of the minutia of mitzvos and halacha, even a nuance that is of rabbinic origin. And certainly, God forbid, we should ever change the time of mitzvos. And whoever increases to perform mitzvos with the most precision, behold, they are praiseworthy. And this was at the core of this conflict between the Hasidim and those that opposed them in the 18th century. The stories they say about his commitment to mitzvos are astounding. So I'll give you some examples. His students said that from the time he matured, he never prayed outside of a minion, never once. And once he was traveling, a minion is a quorum of, of men needed to pray together as a group. So once he was traveling and there was, he was in a location where there was no minion, there, was not, there, were, there weren't 10 people uh, requisite, the requisite 10 people to make a minion. So what did he do? He hired wagons and he sent them to all the various towns and collected 10 people so that they should be able to pray together with a minion. And its fastidiousness with halacha and precision of halacha is evident in his responsa. Uh, he, like we said earlier, he received many halachic queries from all over the world. And one of his students, Rabbi David Tevel, who would go on to author a set of books on the Talmud called Nachlas David, he wrote that whenever Rabbi Chaim was given a particularly difficult question, he would review all of Talmud over three days to make sure he gets the answer correctly. There's another great story uh, regarding his daughter, whose name was Chasya. So he had a daughter whose name was Chasya, who lived in a different city, the city of Lida. And one day there was a visitor that he had and uh, who was traveling to the city. So Rab Chaim decided to send a letter to his daughter. And so he writes a letter and he gives it to this man. And the man goes and he's on his way to his city to deliver this letter to Rab Chaim's daughter. A few minutes later, he sends a messenger, go get the individual and bring him back. I want the letter back. So he comes and he gives him the letter and he wants it back, okay. And he gives him a second letter instead. And he says, okay, you go, you go now. So his son, Reb Itzala, he was somewhat surprised. Like, you wrote a letter to your daughter, my sister, and you sent it with a messenger. And then you swapped it out for a different one. What's going on? So his father tells him that... Actually, the letter contained the same content. But because her name is Chasya, and the way it sounds is not identical to the way it's spelled, therefore, some people spell it incorrectly or imprecisely, and that could cause a problem with regards to writing a divorce document. The halacha is very clear that when you write a divorce document, you have to use the halachic name, not the nickname. And the name Chasya, the way it's spelled, the way it sounds, uh, you would spell it a Ches and Samach Yud Hey. However, halachically, it has to be spelled with a Ches Samach Aleph. Therefore, I was worried, what's going to be? I'll send this letter to my daughter, and maybe it will be used as source material of my position of how to write this name. So I said, I just changed the way it's spelled so that mistakes don't happen. And the epilogue of the story is that sometime later, his daughter came to visit him, and Reb Itzala, Reb Chaim's son, happens to be talking with his sister, and she tells him, oh, there was an interesting episode. The rabbi of the city, he was writing a get, a divorce document, for a woman whose name was Chasya. And there was a whole question, well, how do you write the name? 
So the rabbi had an idea. Let me go to the daughter of Reb Chaim, whose name is Chasya, and find out how he spelled the name. And Chasya said, well, I happen to have a letter just sent to me recently by my, by my father. Why don't we look at it? And indeed, they looked at it and spelled it correctly. Just an amazing little episode anecdote. Now, in addition to his many myriad halachic responsa, Reb Chaim wrote two works that still today are revered as absolute classics and mainstays on every Jewish bookshelf. The first, called Ruach Chaim, which means the spirit of light, of life, is a magnificent, sweeping commentary on Pirkei Avos and chapters of uh, of the Fathers, the book of the Mishnah that talks about ethics and midos and character, and it's replete with incisive, foundational insights onto Torah and to human character and behavior. An amazing book. Just a few ideas I want to share with you from that book. In chapter 4, the Mishnah says, Ben Azai Omer, Ben Azai says, Haviratz lemitzvah kala uboreach min ha'avera. You should run in pursuance of a minor mitzvah, uboreach, and you should flee min ha'avera from a sin. So this, this seems like good advice. You should pursue, run after mitzvahs, and run away from sin. Reb Chaim draws a magnificent insight from this idea. What it's telling us, you have to run after mitzvos because the mitzvos are fleeing from you. You have to run away from sin because sin is chasing you. And what he explains here is that we know our decisions are based upon free will. And the free will has to be balanced. And the free will is this conflict between body and soul, between our eternal aspect and our ephemeral aspects. And the soul wants to do a mitzvah, and this body wants to do a sin. But the soul is much more powerful. And the body, of course, how could the body stand a chance? How could it be balanced? And here is the answer. There is a drive that we have towards improving the status of our body towards sin, and that's what it means is that the sin is chasing us. We have to flee away from it. We have to take an active stance against it or else we will capitulate. Whereas mitzvah, the soul, is deliberately made fleeting. It's deliberately made less exciting. Less. No one has a passionate urges to do mitzvot. That's just the way it is by design. The Yetzer Tov, the good inclination that, that, that motivates us to do mitzvot, to embrace our soul, is significantly weakened and diminished compared to the Yetzer Ra, the evil inclination that drives us to do sin. And that strikes a balance where we have mitzvot that give us a much more uh, powerful experience and lasting pleasure but it's much harder to achieve, whereas the sin, it's the empty calories, it makes you, it's a junk food, so to speak, you desire it much more strongly, but the feeling you have a negative backlash and that, that creates this balance. Interesting idea um, that is a foundational insight uh, to Jewish philosophy. Another example um, that I like to quote from chapter 5 in chapter 5, it talks about uh, 10 generations from Noah to Abraham. And then it says Abraham was tested with 10 tests. But if you'll notice, in successive Mishnayas, in successive teachings, the Mishnah changes the name of Abraham. When it's talking about Abraham's lineage, it says there's 10 generations from Noah to Abraham. Whereas when it's talking about Abraham's spiritual pedigree, his 10 tests that he was given, it calls him Abraham, our father, Avraham Avinu. So why are we changing the name of Abraham within two teachings, one after another? And he says, another amazing insight, Abraham's tests, vis-a-vis his tests, he is our father. 
What does that mean? It means that when you read Genesis and you learn all about the tests of Abraham, what you're actually discovering is the background of the Jewish character. What Abraham was tested, vis-a-vis his tests, he's our father. He created the identity, the spiritual identity of the nation. And those characteristics, kindness, for example, martyrdom, commitment to God, it actually became integrated into the spiritual DNA of Abraham and was perpetuated to his descendants. As an example, he writes, we know Abraham was someone who faced a test where he was thrown into a fire. He was There was an attempt, at least, to have him killed for what he stood for, for his beliefs. Says Reb Chaim, this created a Jewish inclination towards martyrdom, standing up for, for what you believe in, even if it means giving up your life. An amazing book called Ruach Chaim that he wrote. A second magnificent book of Reb Chaim is called Nefesh HaChaim, or The Soul of Life. This is a primary work on Jewish ideology and philosophy of magisterial scope. And again, we could give an entire year uh, of lectures on this particular book. Just one idea I want to share with you uh, from from the fourth uh, section uh, in chapter 29. He writes that the 613 mitzvos according to the Zohar, correspond to the 613 parts of the person. And he reveals what a mitzvah does to a person. When someone does one mitzvah, there is a corresponding part of him, both body and soul, that are connected to that mitzvah. And thus, you do a mitzvah, what you're essentially doing is you're feeding your soul with spiritual nourishment. And that's both with positive and negative mitzvos. And then he writes, he quotes many verses, etc., that Torah is like a multivitamin. If someone, if mitzvos are medicine or food for the soul, each mitzvah corresponds to an aspect of the soul, then Torah is the multivitamin which actually heals and provides nourishment to the entirety of the person. And of course, this is an insight uh, into why Jews are obsessed with Torah, because Torah is what gives us eternal life. Regardless, either one of these works would have rendered him a giant of Torah with a towering impact for the generations that followed. But his grandest achievement was the famed Velazhin Yeshiva that he founded in 1803. This was the first modern yeshiva and the template that all future yeshivas are are modeled afterwards. Now, it's important to note, yeshivas always existed, but the model was entirely different. Until then, in Eastern Europe, boys went to cheder, which is essentially like like an elementary school, from when they were about three until they were about bar mitzvah, 13, Some dropped out to go to work earlier. And the elite, those who showed particular aptitude and diligence in their studies, or those who came from wealthy or rabbinic families, they would continue their studies into their adolescent years and beyond, generally studying with the rabbi of the town. So it was one of the roles of a rabbi of every community was to study with the teenagers, teach them Torah, the teenagers of the town. But there was no formal curriculum, there's no dormitory, there's no staff, a rabbi teaching students in the local synagogue, the local based medrash, room of Torah scholarship. If one of those students showed particular promise, then he would be sent out to a bigger city, a city with a more notable rabbinical scholars, and he would study with a greater rabbi, a greater scholar, for a period of time, eventually he too would be ordained and become a rabbi on his own merit. That was the system prior. Rabbi Chaim envisioned a large, centralized institution where all the top students came together from all across Europe and drew support not just from a localized community, 
but from the entire Jewish world. All the greatest genius and the mo- geniuses and the most capable students from all over the nation would gather, and under the tutelage of the greatest scholars and teachers, they would flourish into the future rabbis and Torah scholars and leaders of the, of the generation. Of course, uh, when he had this idea, he proposed it to the Gona Vilna in, I think, 1792, or in the early 1790s, and he was rebuffed. The, the Gohan told him, no, this, don't do this. And of course, he shelved his plan. Several years later, he again raised the proposal, and this time the Gohan acceded and agreed and said, go ahead with it. Well, what changed? What's the difference? How come earlier you told me not to do it, now yes? The Gohan told him, well, told him, well, earlier you were really confident and sure of yourself. You spoke with such enthusiasm and conviction. You were supremely sure sh- that the project would be successful. You don't change the Jewish world. You don't reorient the, how the nation operates with such an attitude. If you want to bring about transformational change, it has to be with humility, it has to be with a more subdued, hesitant tone, one where you're not convinced that it'll be successful and you rely on God to make sure that you'll get there and that indeed will bear great fruit. Now that the Gon gave him his endorsement, the plan was set into motion. He sent letters to all the rabbis of all the cities of Europe told them to send your best students to study in the yeshiva in Volazhin. The response was overwhelming. The idea took off, and a large number of students were sent to the Volazhin yeshiva. Eventually, there would be over over 400 students studying in one centralized institution, which today doesn't sound like much, but at the time was absolutely revolutionary. It is said that the day that the yeshiva opened, Reb Chaim fasted. He didn't eat the whole day. And he cried that everything should go well, prayed, and mixed those tears into the cement to have the foundation of this grand yeshiva have it supported by his tears and by his prayers. This Valajan yeshiva, this centralized institution where all the promising budding scholars of Europe gathered was truly revolutionary and unprecedented. First of all, the schedule and the devotion to Torah was mind-blowing. The students would get up at 4 a.m. and start studying for four hours before praying, and then study again in the mid-morning, and then have a short break, and three in the afternoon to midnight. The average day was between 15 and 18 hours of study. There were those that had a different schedule. They would study 36 hours consecutively and then sleep for 10. It's just mind-blowing, the Uh, the dedication and the devotion to Torah study. One of Reb Chaim's themes in his book, Nefesh HaChaim, is the idea that Torah is the spiritual energy that provides a flow of vitality to the world. The idea being that this world is dependent upon God for its continued existence. It's not, it's not like that the world will go on in perpetuity unless something changes. It's the opposite. The world demands a continuous flow of what's called influence from God for it to sustain. What provides us the merit to have our world continue? Torah study. And he writes that if there was no one in the world studying Torah for even one second, the world would resort back to being nothingness, to being desolate. And therefore, in Valajan, they said, well, this is, the war- this is the yeshiva of the Jewish nation. It's upon us to make sure the world continues. And they had shifts where there were students studying Torah 24-7. You would go to the yeshiva at 2 a.m., in the morning, you'll see people studying. Seven in the afternoon, studying. 24-7. Shabbos, festivals, only one day a year there was no there was no Torah study on the ninth day of Av, where Torah study is forbidden. Another innovation of Valajan, how to study Torah. People today who go to visit 
a yeshiva and they've never been there before are frequently startled at what they see. A room full of young men studying in pairs, but screaming at each other. There's a there's an electric atmosphere, vibrancy and passion and vigorous, exhilarating argumentation, all as the students try to find the truth of Torah. And, and Yeshiva today has that same model based upon what was pioneered in Velazhin. And you, you walk in and it's very noisy and maybe it's even distractive. It's not quite like walking into a library, everyone silently peering into their own book. Rab Chaim emphasized for a yeshiva to have the atmosphere that is going to infuse the students with enthusiasm and joy for Torah, it has to be alive. The students have to be studying in masses with a loud and engaging atmosphere. And particularly in the early part of the 19th century, when Torah and fidelity to Torah was under assault, it's important to have this counterbalance where Torah, where there's the bastion of Torah that is alive, that is vibrant. And in Velazhin, they would study Torah and Talmud from beginning to end. They had a set curriculum. They would go through the entire Talmud every 10 years. And there were many students who, over their course of their tenure in Velazhin, they would study the entire Talmud, which is an astonishing feat in its own right, but they would study it in depth several times. And the great Rabbi Avraham Yitzchak HaKohen Kuk, Rav Kuk, who became the first chief rabbi of Israel, when he studied in Velazhin in the latter half of the 19th century, uh, over his five-year tenure in Velazhin, he finished the entire Talmud a staggering 17 times. Uh, for someone to study a whole book of Talmud is a grand achievement. To study the entire Talmud, it's unbelievable. To study it multiple times is otherworldly. Uh, but such an institution succeeded in taking the best minds of the Jewish world and turning them into Torah giants. Today, we could say that yeshiva is essentially there to produce Torah Jews. In Europe, 200 years ago, the purpose of yeshiva was to produce Torah giants. That got started in Velazhin. But to do that, he had to have other innovations that became standards, notably fundraising. Previously, like we said, every community had its own yeshiva with its own teacher, with its own rabbi, and it was supported by the local town. And one way they would do that is what's called teg essen, which literally means eating days. You have a student who's studying Torah. Well, where's he going to eat? There's no, there's, no, there's no dormitory. There's no dining room. So they would have a rotation where families in the town would offer to have a yeshiva student come eat a meatloaf on Mondays. Uh, and then he would go to the next night and study and, and eat um, by a second family, and then a third family, and a fourth, and Shabbos go to a, a fifth family, etc. Reb Chaim felt that if yeshiva, if we're going to create a an identity where the Torah scholars are viewed in the highest regard, we can't have them be farmed out to families to eat like a beggar. We're going to have the yeshiva provide its own meals. Well, to do that, you have to fundraise. Velazhin is a tiny little town in the middle of nowhere. It can't sustain such a massive institution. So he would personally fundraise. The greatest rabbi of his time would go around the world, around Europe, eventually even in America, along with a team of fundraisers, to raise the money needed to sustain such an institution. Again, this is a transformation. Yeshivas are no longer localized to their town, to their region. It's now a national yeshiva of an entire people. Uh, Reb Chaim himself never took a salary from the yeshiva. His wife had a small store uh, from which they eked out a meager living. He wanted to be assured that all the money he would raise for the yeshiva would be dedicated to the yeshiva and to, it, to its students. And he was a master pedagogue. 
He had an ingenious mind, a pure heart. His sharpness and incisiveness and profundity of his studies was evident to all, including his love of people, his veritable holiness and piety. And he succeeded in influencing and guiding legions of students to become become great Torah leaders on their own right. Just one quick story about his holiness uh, from one of his students, Rab Zundel of Salant, who would become the teacher of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, another grand innovator of the uh, Torah world and the Jewish world at large in the 19th century. So the story goes, there was a man in Salant who saw Rab Zundel Salanter blowing a shofar on Rosh Hashanah. And he said that he, he sensed this lofty aura to Rabbi Zundel Salant as he's blowing the shofar. So he he goes over to him and says to him, I, I just see this, this, this aura, this spiritual light on you. Where does it come from? So he says, well, my teacher, Rabbi Chaim of Valashin, every morning when he put on his talus and tefillin, he had this aura around him. What my teacher had every day, I have once a year when I blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. And Reb Chaim dedicated his life towards this yeshiva to craft these Torah giants. But despite all these newfound responsibilities, he never forgot about the simple people of Velush. And every day he would give a lecture on the Parsha and the Mishnayas to the simple people who weren't his students. The yeshiva took off and attracted hundreds of students from all over Europe. And there's another aspect of the yeshiva and the Volazhin yeshiva and the many institutions that followed its lead that is important to mention. And that is that it served as a, as a bulwark in Eastern Europe against the growing tide of Haskalah that was taking over Western Europe. Now, previously, you go back 500 years ago, a boy with a good Jewish mind, he had two choices. He could study Talmud, become a great Torah scholar, or become a carpenter or a tanner or a shopkeeper. The intellectual options, aside from Torah, were almost nil. He wasn't going to pick up Plato or Socrates or Kant and become a philosopher. But beginning in the middle of the 1700s, there's the Enlightenment, there's the Reform, there's the Haskalah, there's the Emancipation, and now there's competition. Good Jewish minds could find something other than Torah to occupy themselves with. And many would embrace secular ideologies and, sadly, abandon Torah as a result. So there's this detrimental intellectual movement that is destroying vast swaths of great potential Jewish leaders from the nation. And to resist it, you have to come up with an intellectual movement that could provide a reasonable resistance. And over the next century, the yeshiva movement, especially Velazhin, that became the battleground for this tug of war over the geniuses and the future of the nation. The Velazhin yeshiva and the modern yeshiva movement that it spawned was a uh, ex nihilo innovation, a new radical revolutionary approach to Jewish living that did not exist prior. And it reframed the Jewish nation and armed the Jewish tradition and Torah with a capable opposition to Haskalah. Over the next few episodes, we're going to learn about two other grand innovators of the 19th century who created new paradigms for a nation facing uh, existential dilemmas. In conclusion, I want to read several quotes about Rabbi Chaim's legacy. The first one I want to read from my grandfather. The school of the Gon of Vilna was a fortress of Torah and Halacha in all its purity and perfection, both in the hidden and the revealed aspects of Torah. 
Rabbi Chaim Volazhin wrote his books and founded his yeshiva to serve as a faithful continuation of the way of the Gona Vilna. The yeshiva is the continuation of the Gona Vilna with respect to the revealed aspects of Torah. His books, they are the continuation and they are the legacy of the Gona Vilna regarding the hidden aspects of Torah. One of his students who authored a book called the Galia Masechta, uh, he pointed out in his eulogy of Reb Chaim that uh, the Talmud tells us that great people, the Almighty gives them full years. Like Abraham, he died on his birthday. He was given a certain amount of years and he did not lose any of those days due to sin. And this student did the calculation that Rabbi Chaim Volajner actually died not on the day he was born, not on the, on the anniversary or the birthday, rather on the day of his bris, the day we know a week after a Jewish boy is born, they're circumcised, and that's the formal entry of the Jewish boy into the Jewish covenant, into the Abrahamic covenant. And that's when you really, your soul, so to speak, is born. And he died on that anniversary, and that it makes sense that such a great and holy a tzaddik, a pious person, is going to not is not going to lose uh, any days due to any uh, misdeeds. Uh, another one of his students, Reb David Tevel, wrote in his hespit in his eulogy of his great teacher, and he writes, "Quote: uh, The matter is known and publicized that he was great in his dissemination of Torah." to hundreds and to thousands, and in a way on a scale that was not present for many, many generations, that it's proper to say that our great master is remembered for good, because if not for him, the Jewish nation would have forgotten Torah. Again, we see a pattern in Jewish history that repeats itself again and again. When the Jewish nation faces a dire need, a salvation will invariably emerge in the form of great leaders, of great innovators who cater to the needs of the people and guide and direct the nation forward. In that spirit, I'd like to again remind you that our Torah organization, Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston, is in dire need of your support after the devastating hurricane. Please visit RebuildTorch.com to help us rebuild. And I thank you.